The Retirement Cafe Podcast, Episode 9. Everything you need to know about lasting power of attorneys with Fiona Hill. Retired or thinking about retirement? You've come to the right place. Welcome to the Retirement Cafe Podcast. In each episode, we bring you an important conversation with insight, tips and knowledge, all designed to help you live a fulfilling and successful life in retirement. Here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner and Accredited Later Life Advisor, Justin King. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast. In this episode, I welcome Fiona Heald. Fiona is a partner in the quarter protection team at Moore Blatch Solicitors. She specializes in looking after the interests of vulnerable people, making sure that those who don't necessarily have a voice have a voice. This is a highly specialized area of law, requiring not only expert legal advice, but also the ability to understand the emotional issues that arise. One of the key services Fiona and her team provide is helping people put powers of attorney in place. Fiona talks about why you would need a power of attorney, what type you may need, and how you go about getting one. A power of attorney is a powerful document because it allows someone, called an attorney, to make important decisions on your behalf. Fiona discusses how you should choose your attorneys and explains the powers this gives them. So here's my interview with Fiona Hild. So I'm really excited to be joined by Fiona Hild from More Blatch Solicitors today uh, for another wonderful um, episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast. And uh, Fiona, Fiona is a specialist solicitor working for More Blatch Solicitors working in the areas of uh, private client work and helping that's kind of real normal clients who need advice around powers of attorney, wills, trusts, estate planning and all that type of thing. So welcome, Fiona. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for joining us today. Not a problem at all. Now, I know you came to one of our live events and, um, you know, one of the most popular guests. So uh, so it's lovely to welcome you back to our um, podcast uh, uh, version um, so can, could you just tell our listeners a little bit about you, how you've ended up in this beautiful place in Livington and, and you know, a bit about your career and, uh, and your story? I certainly will. Um, I qualified 25 years ago um, and started off work as a, a general private client, D- did a bit of everything um, that, that was wills and tax and trusts and things like that. Um, and then as time went on, mental incapacity became more and more of a thing because sadly more people are being diagnosed with dementia or more issues are happening. And in a modern world, it doesn't always catch up with what happens in real people's lives. Uh, so trying to give people who can't necessarily uh, have a voice, have a voice, uh, making sure that people can plan for their future uh, and what they want will happen when they can't say it will will happen. Um, and to try and make sure that what, what they want will occur. Okay, so have you always been with More Blatch? Or no, you... I uh, I started off my training in the West Country wow. uh, and then have been in a couple of high street firms in Hampshire. I moved to uh, a little niche practice on the other side of the forest um, and then um, was lucky enough to be offered um, working in this particular area and specialising even more um, at More Blatch and came here nearly five years ago. Wow. And, and Limington is, a, you know, if you haven't visited Limington, it's a stunning it's town, isn't it? stunning, stunning place. I'm very lucky. On a good day, I can see the sea from the offices, which is always handy. Lovely, lovely. Now, I can imagine um, a little bit like Christchurch, uh, where I'm from, the, there's probably quite a substantial kind of retired community here. There is certainly right? is, yes. And therefore, yes. looking at people's wills, powers of attorney, that type of thing, is probably quite a big big part of your business. Uh, it is quite a big part of the business. Um, I tend to be slightly wider. Uh, we have a Richmond office, which is also a lovely building, so I, I get so to go Richmond up there, London, Richmond, oh, London. Wow, okay. So we, we have a sort of a, a large corridor and area. Yeah. Uh, and because I specialise in, in the mental incapacity side of things, if anyone else in the business has a, an issue with incapacity, so you've got somebody selling a property, but one of the people selling can't act because they're ill, uh, then I get involved with all of that as well. So it's mental incapacity and care fees are the two things I spend most of my time on. Great, great. Now, the one topic I really wanted to touch on you, and I know you have a lot of expertise in this, is powers of attorney. Yes. Because I know that listeners to the um, the, Retirement Cafe podcast 
know about powers of attorney, they may have had a power of attorney put into place in the past. I think there was something called the enduring power of attorney. I think those things have changed now. Can you tell me uh, why do you need a power of attorney? Um, what type of power of attorney do you need? And how do you go about getting one? Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> um, there are a lot of different types of power of attorney. The, the common uh, two that people create now um, are both lasting powers of attorney. Uh, there's one for property and finance. Uh, so that covers stocks and shares, pensions, houses, anything financial at all uh, that would involve collecting in uh, income, claiming any uh, like attendance allowance or benefits or things like that. Uh, spending money, always the fun part, um, and dealing with that side of things. And then you have the health and welfare power, uh, which deals with uh, your body and where you live and operations and doctors and things like that. So they do do two completely separate things, even if you appoint the same people to do them. There was, uh, before 2007, an enduring power of attorney, uh, which just dealt with property and finance. So lots of people have those. I, I spent the summer of 2007 running around getting people to sign them. Um, but that is literally only to do with property and finance. If you've got one of those, you still need a health and welfare lasting power of attorney. If you haven't got anything, then you need to consider having both types of power of attorney. So um, why... I mean, obviously, I under, there's, a, there's an element of me which kind of goes, well, it'd be sensible to have someone to be able to act. Yes. Um, but how does this, you know, what? how does this really work? I mean, who do you choose to be a power of attorney? I mean, you know, did someone like you be a power of attorney for someone? That, or, that, or, that is know? the $64,000 question, ah, ah, actually. <laughs> um, so, obviously, in my book, I'm going to encourage everybody to have uh, both types of power of attorney because we never know when something's going to happen. It's not just looking at things like dementia, uh, strokes and stuff like that. It'll also be if people have car crashes or um, something uh, else could happen. You, you never know. If I knew what was going to happen to my clients, my life would be a lot easier. Mm. Um, so um, what we suggest is, is that people have both types. Okay. Um, but what we're really looking for um, is who, who do you trust? Because obviously it's a really big thing to hand over um, the ability to empty your bank account, not that we want them to, um, but they could, they are going to be you for everything financial. That's a really important task. So you need somebody who, who's, who you trust. You need somebody who's got the skills. There are some fabulous people on this planet who are rubbish with money. Sure. They sure. are really trustworthy, but you don't want them near your bank account. No. Um, and then you need people who have got time. So if you've got somebody who spends all their time flying around the world, bad idea to get them to try and deal with your finances because bless them with the best will in the world yeah. they're not going to have time so usually people will look at family um a lot of people just think of in, uh, appointing their children um well that's fine except in my world um husbands and wives are a team and they should be looking after each other mm -hmm. and they forget that they should be they look after each other and they're, they're just worried about what happens and the children need to do things so appointing each other if you've got an each other yeah. is a really good idea having the children if they've got time etc cetera, etc cetera, works but it doesn't have to be um it can be nieces nephews godchildren friend anybody who you think will be on your side and will speak out for you if you can't is, is perfect solicitors can be right. Uh, the trouble is, obviously, we like to be paid so we can live indoors and pay mortgages and things like that. Um, and that's not necessarily best for you. Sure. If we can get somebody who can do it for free, yeah. even better. Yeah. However, with certain family dynamics, second families, family fallouts, uh, maybe people sadly have got addictions or they've married the wrong person or whatever, there's 101 reasons, then solicitors can act. But we like to be the last resort. Sure. If, if there is nobody... Um, or nobody you want, then obviously solicitors are more than happy to act. But I like to look at the options first, just to make sure we haven't overlooked somebody. Yeah. If we just accept that, uh, you know, when I, I, I do accept that your statement of that everybody needs a power of attorney, one for health and welfare, one for financial affairs. How does someone go about doing it? I mean, can they... Can they just write it out? Can they just, you know, do a document? Uh, do a document. <laughs> if only life was so simple. That there are several ways of doing it. Um, you can do it on the government website. 
Uh, they have a system whereby you can go online and, and deal with it. These forms, though, are deceptively simple. They look like you can just put in your name, mm. address, date of birth. Right. Pretty certain most of us can do that without even blinking. The problem is you can easily get them wrong. You can appoint the wrong people the wrong way uh, and cause chaos. I've had uh, powers of attorney brought to me that you just can't use. Uh. Or something happens and uh, the backup doesn't work the way they thought it would work. Um, so for 50% of the people, potentially, I think the online system would work. Yeah. What worries me is the other 50. Okay. Um, because these are really, really powerful documents. People think of a will as a powerful document. By definition, that only kicks in when you die. Yeah. These documents mean somebody will have access to all your money or make massive decisions about you while you are alive. So we need to make sure they're done the right way. Absolutely. So the other way of dealing with them is obviously somebody like me. Um, there are a few advantages. Uh, we uh, will look at what other aspects might need to be dealt with. So letters of wishes. Uh, so you might have somebody who wants to live in a nursing home in the country. Um, or they have particular views about do not resuscitate. And it's really important. There's a rule book. Uh, financial matters. You know, I want to be able to stay in my home um, and maybe get equity release to pay for care at home. Okay. Things like that. All of those need to be in so people know what, what they should be doing. Uh, there might be views about, well, I only want this person to act and these other people are a spare or would you consult so-and-so? So that there's a great deal of that that goes on. So um, solicitors, shock news, are actually quite helpful on occasions. Um, okay. And we can produce uh, a document that is, is, because it is so personal, yeah. that really is just down to what you need. Yeah, sure. If you, you, you realise you needed a power of attorney, you yeah. either go online and you do it yourself and you, yes. and you, and you have a go and hopefully yeah. that works, or alternatively, you come to someone like yourself and yes. it, it helps you do it. Yes. Once you do it, I mean, first of all, I presume you print out this form and you have to send it somewhere and I presume you have to yeah. pay some fees. There, there, and there's a whole, whole procedure. A yes. Um, but we'll go through that, I'm sure, because that'll be really interesting to know exactly what you have to do. But... Does that mean that whoever you've appointed can now start accessing your bank account? Okay, another large question. He's very good at these. If we start from the beginning, yeah. you decide who you want to act as your attorneys. That's really, really important. Uh, you need to work out how you want them to act and when you want them to act. Right. So for property and financial affairs, um, you can have them either act only when you lose mental capacity okay. or you can have them act as soon as it's registered. And I'll, I'll come back to what that means in a moment. The problem is most people think, I only want people to do things when I'm mentally incapable. But the problems we come across are people uh, might become housebound, or they might break a limb, or they get arthritis and they can't sign anything, yeah. uh, or they become physically unable to get anywhere. I don't know about other high streets. Um, I know that Christchurch and Limington do share something in common. It's not the easiest place to park directly outside the bank to get into the bank. No. And that can sometimes cause problems for people. So the best way to do it is, is to have flexibility. With all things, we want flexibility. So you've decided on your attorneys, you've decided how they're going to act and when they act. You've got the forms completed. Um, and then what happens is you have to sign because you are giving away the power to do it. On the health and welfare one, there's another twiddly bit which talks about end of life. So you need to decide when you're doing the health and welfare one whether or not you want your attorneys to have end of life powers, which in English means are they going to be able to make decisions uh, at the end of your life or do you want the doctors to do it? And there are advantages and disadvantages to both. With the health and welfare one, though, as long as you can make that decision, even if all you can do is a thumbs up, thumbs down or blink, yeah. you are still in control. Ah. It's only when you can't do anything and you have been proved you can't do that, that then your attorneys will make decisions. Right. So the two are similar in some respects, but health and welfare um, is, is, is much more limited as to when it can be used. So property and finance, I can't be bothered with my finances, just in case sort them out for me. I'm mentally capable, I just can't be bothered to do it. Okay. I'm mentally incapable, you have to do everything, you can do it. If um, for uh, health and welfare, I do need to make decisions. I can ask you, so what do you think about this? Should I have a flu jab this year? Should I go for this operation? But the decision is mine until I can't make that decision. So just because somebody's been given power of attorney does not mean to say they rule your life. 
they right. do decide to rule your life, you need to come see somebody like me so I can sort it out. Uh -huh. Okay. okay. Um, but having got the, the power of attorney signed by you, got it witnessed, you then need a person called a certificate provider. Right. The certificate provider is an independent person who's going to make sure that you knew what you were signing. Nobody had bullied you, uh, twisted your arm, said this is what you should do, this is how you should do it. Make sure that you understand what you're signing because that's really, really important. If you don't understand what you're signing, we end up with plan B, which we'll come back to later. So the certificate provider then does their bit. Then if I'm dealing with matters, I send all the bits to the attorneys for the attorneys to sign because an attorney has to accept that job. They have to say, yes, I want to do it. Okay. Uh, they sign all their bits. Once everybody signed everything, then goes off to the Office of the Public Guardian in Birmingham um, and then uh, they will register it. Right. Now, that registration process uh, depends on how busy the Office of the Public Guardian are. Mm. So from start to finish, so from the day you come see me or you open up your computer and yeah. say, this is what I want, to the date you actually have a registered document that can be used can be anywhere between three or five months depending on how long the Office of the Public Guardian um, are dealing with matters, how long your attorneys take to send back forms, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It's not a short process. No. If you've got somebody in a hurry, uh, there is a slightly different type of power of attorney, but that has its own complications. Okay. Um, but for lasting powers of attorney, you need to think, if I'm doing it today, you'll probably see a registered one sometime end of March, beginning of April next year. I'll come back to the, you know, obviously when we send that form off, there's probably a cheque attached, I can imagine. There is the whole £82 per document. Okay, £82. So that's just so that people know what it's, what, it, what it's likely to cost. But I can also imagine that a lot of people possibly haven't thought of powers of attorney and suddenly find that mum or dad or it, it could be someone younger, of course, that they've had an accident, etc. But let's just imagine that the classic case that mum and dad are getting a little bit... Um, frail or elderly and not ability to get around so much and they want to then and and possibly also they're not sure whether some of the decisions they're making are the right decisions so if it's going to take five months you know this is a bit of a this is a bit of a pickle isn't it <laughs> and then also you mentioned before about having the capacity to do so well who makes that decision Someone like me, right. if I'm being the certificate provider ah, okay uh, because I'm the one who's got to put my name to it right. now if I have any doubts, I will always, always get a second opinion. I'm, I'm not the all powerful. So if I say no, that doesn't mean to say the end of it. Um, what we do, though, if we've got somebody who is frail and somebody who maybe has been diagnosed, having dementia diagnosis does not mean you can't do things. Right. What we need to do is uh, instead of having you come into the office, um, because there's a certain stress in getting ready on time, not wanting to be late, uh, dealing with that side of things, um, is very much a case of um, maybe I should come see you in your own home. Yeah. If you're sat in your own home, you've had your breakfast, you've read your paper, you're really quite chilled and laid back, and then someone like me turns up and just wants to have a chat with you, then you're going to be in a much more receptive frame of mind than if you've had to get dressed and get to the to Limington or wherever, get yourself a car parking space, get into the office and deal with all of that. So we look at trying to make sure that it, it's as, as comfortable as possible for that person, maximise their capacity so that they're at their best. Yeah. And if they've had a bad day at night, they, they've had four hours sleep or whatever, let's not do it that day. So a lot of my time is when are they best? Are they morning people? Are they afternoon so it's people? The, of the time of doing the absolutely. document rather than the, We don't need to worry. 100% yes, of the time. absolutely. I need, on the day it is signed, you to understand it. It doesn't matter if 20 minutes later you haven't got a clue who I am or why I've come to visit you, providing you've retained that information for long enough yeah. to know what you're doing and why, then that's fine. Obviously, if I'm in that situation, I do a few more checks and things like that. It's not just that, oh, hi, sign this, Justin. Um, but we, we do try and make sure once it's been signed, then in the nicest possible way, if you lost capacity the next day, not great because we haven't got a document we can use, but I don't need to worry about you anymore. I just need to try and get everybody else to sign quickly so we can start doing things. Yeah, and then of course it's off and it's And then processed. it's off and it's processed yeah. to get registered. And even four or five months down the track and it comes back from the Office yeah. of Public Guardian, it's all yeah. fine and everyone can use it. And with property and financial affairs, most of the time, 
we know ways around things. There are other things we can be doing. Health and welfare one is the difficult one, okay. where you get the call that says, you know, they've just had a stroke. Yeah. We don't know what's going to happen. We need power of attorney. And then we have to sit there and think, well, they're in no position to sign now. And if we do do it, will they be around later? Which is a horrible conversation to have with somebody who's already in shock. But I don't want them spending money on a document that they're then not going to be able to use. No. So this is why the earlier, in my personal dictatorship, you do your will, you do both types of power of attorney, then you have your first legal drink on your 18th birthday. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, so um, yeah, it should be the first document presented to, um, to a youngster, I suppose. Um, yeah, very interesting. I mean, one of the things that I've picked up with my own clients is that I kind of make it a mandatory requirement that, that they have powers of attorney in place for the, for the financial affairs because I don't want to be sat with a spouse who's, who I've dealt with for many years who comes in and says, you know, my husband or my wife has had is, is a stroke at the weekend. Um, we need some money out of XYZ investment or pension or contract, what have you. And I'm going, I can't act. Yeah, yeah. And I would feel so awful. It that, is, that, it is that, not a good way to spend the morning. I've all those years and yeah. then I had to send and say, well, I can't do it. Yeah. So I kind of make it a prerequisite yeah. for being a client now is that we have those documents and, done. And that's good because with, with ISAs and premium bonds, people have things in their own name. If you have a joint bank account, people think, I don't need a power of attorney. We've got a joint bank account. And technically, under the banking rules, if one of those people with a joint bank account becomes mentally incapable, that account can be frozen by the bank. Wow. And that can just cause chaos. And I don't think a lot of people and know that. Lots of people don't know that. People think, oh, well, it's fine. I've got internet access to mum's account, so it's okay. Again, that's a breach of, uh, in fact, the Computer Misuse Act. Okay. Because you can't pretend to be somebody else online. Right. Um, people say, I've got the bank card. Yep. Again, breach of terms of business with the, wow. the bank. So again, it, it's not a good idea. The other problem we find is people say, oh, well, I'll, I'll be a joint account with mum. Yeah. And that'll be fine because then I can go in. Yeah. But there are uh, legal implications to that. There's tax. If you get into financial difficulties, if you divorce, mum's money gets added to yours. And that's not what should happen. So it's just making sure that with a power of attorney, you've appointed the right people yeah. at the right time. They're able to act with protection because they're covered by all the laws that cover them. Yeah. And you know that there are safeguards as to make sure that they do the job the right way. Yeah, sure. You know, this has been really interesting and I can't, I, I can only imagine how informative this has been. I've probably just got one last question, I think, around this. I can imagine anyone who's been appointed power of attorney. This comes with, you know, quite a lot of responsibility. How do, how do they know what they're taking on when they go, when mum says, oh, will you be my power of attorney or Nick needs it? You know, how do they know what they're signing up for? As a lawyer, I'm obviously going to say this. What we do is we produce a lot of guidance. Right. So before they sign up, they get a lot of guidance. Okay. They get a, this is what you're taking on, be warned. Right. Some people don't want to do that. They don't feel they can bring their best to the party. It would be nice if there was more guidance because uh, one of the other problems I deal with is where attorneys have gone wrong. Right. And most of the time, they've gone wrong accidentally. They thought they were doing the right thing. Yeah. They weren't to know they weren't. Um, so we produce a lot of guidance. There is guidance on the internet. Um, unfortunately, the code of practice is over 250 pages long. And most of us would much rather watch something on TV than read sure. 250 pages sure. of law. So um, getting advice. The Office of the Public Guardian do produce booklets. Getting advice, um, I'm pretty certain that people like Citizens Advice or somewhere like that would do it. Obviously, lawyers will say, well, well, this is this is what we can do yeah. and this is what you need to be doing specifically if right. you take it on. Great. Well, uh, really informative. Really, really, you know, that's been brilliant, Fiona. Um, where can people find out um, more about you and your firm? Uh, there's our website, which is www.moreblatch.com. Uh, they can uh, Google Fiona Heald uh, and I pop up top of the list, <laughs> which great. is slightly bizarre on occasions. Um, and um, they'll be able to find out uh, contact details and email and phone numbers there. Fantastic. Well, I'll put all that information in the show notes as well. Thank you very um, much. And thank you so much for your time today. No problem at all. A big thank you to Fiona Heald of More Blatch Listeners for joining me for this episode of the Retirement Cafe podcast. Most of us know that we should put a lasting power of attorney in place but it can seem such a big job. Hopefully Fiona's explanation of how to go about doing so 
how to choose your attorney and how to register your LPA shows that it's not necessarily a huge task, although it can be worthwhile for some people to seek the advice of a specialist solicitor. Fiona will be back in a few weeks to share her experience of what happens when you don't have a lasting power of attorney in place for someone who no longer has the mental capacity to make decisions for themselves. The process that you have to go through is complex, costly and time consuming, not to mention harrowing for everyone involved. Make sure you subscribe to Retirement Cafe Podcast so you won't miss this interview. You can do so on your preferred podcast player or on our website at theretirementcafe.co.uk where you can also find the show notes for this episode and some useful links. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave a review on iTunes or your favourite podcast player. Until next time, this is Justin King, helping you feel more informed in your retirement. Thank you for listening to the Retirement Cafe podcast with Justin King. To find out more, you can find us online at theretirementcafe.co.uk. 